mappings with Mapstruct. All right, thank you. <laughs> so welcome to this talk about bean mappings with Mapstruct. Um, I hope you enjoyed the conference so far, and I know it's a lot of content, so I really appreciate you even show up during a lunch break here. That's really cool. Let me tell you quickly a bit about me. So I work as a software engineer at Red Hat, and the project I'm mostly focused on these days is called Debezium, which is a tool for change data capturing. And if you would like to know what this is about and what this can do for you, I did a talk about it yesterday, and the recording should be up on YouTube very soon, so you can check this talk out. I'm the spec lead for Bean Validation 2.0, and I will do a quickie on that one just after this one. So if you are interested in the new features in Bean Validation 2.0, just follow me to the other room and I will do this quickie there. And I'm finally doing some projects on the site, one of them being Mapstruct. And I work on this with an entire community of open source enthusiasts, and I would like to talk a bit about this one today. So what is the problem that Mapstruct is solving for you? Um, so it's mapping between models. And the issue quite often arises in enterprise applications, where you, for instance, have a domain model, which, for instance, maps to your database. And then you might, for instance, have different view models, which might expose just a subset of your data for specific use cases or for specific clients. And then you need to map the data between your internal data map model to those external models. Or you might be calling some other external service, you might be calling some REST service, and again, you, might, you may have to map between your internal model and then this model which is um, you use to access this REST service. And often you will find it there are things, there are concepts, entities, which are essentially the same on a semantic level. So you might have a customer object in your internal model, and you may have a customer in this view model, for instance, and they represent the same thing, but they differ a little bit in their details. So the properties, they may have different names, or they may have different types. There might be something here like the name thing, which is a joint attribute on the view model, but it's it's two, two separate properties, first name and last name in the source model. So this is the kind of difference you may observe. And, well, of course, people run into this problem quite often. And, well, what can, can we do about it? So the first thing would be you just could implement the mappings yourself. So you can just go and implement those mappers. But you would probably agree if I say that's very tedious code to write. It's boring. You need all the tests. So this is not something which is very desirable. And of course, people thought about it, and then they came up with the idea, hey, we can use reflection for this. So we could just iterate over all the properties and then copy them between source and target objects. And yes, this works. But in my experience, there are some downsides to this. And the one is you have quite a hard time to have insight into what's happening. So why are properties mapped in the way they are mapped? Are all the properties mapped? You only will find out about these things at runtime. If something cannot be mapped, you only will find out very late. And also, reflection got faster, much faster over the years, but still there is some noticeable um, performance penalty usually associated to this usage of reflection. Um, so I'm going to present a different approach, and this is using compile time code generation. So what Mapstruct is doing, it generates mapper code at compile time, and then you can use this um, without any further ado at runtime. So the way it works is you define interfaces, plain Java interfaces, um, and you define mapping methods there, which take the source of the object to be mapped as a parameter, and then the target type as a return type. And Mapstruct will generate an implementation of such an interface, as I will show you in a bit. And you then can configure it using some annotations to uh, adjust the mapping process, and we will come to that. All right, so I will uh, go to Eclipse. I've prepared this here. And let me first say, Mapstruct, it's not tied to any IDE. So it's really a plugin for the Java compiler. So the co Java compiler is extensible. You can put in uh, plugins there, which, for instance, generate code, as in our case. But then IDEs such as Eclipse or IntelliJ will pick up those plugins and also make use of those plugins in the IDE. So I have prepared this Maven project here, and I have a customer and a customer DTO object, and I will show you a bit how to map them. And the first thing I need is, in terms of dependencies, I need to add this Mapstruct dependency, which just contains the annotations which we are using. So they won't be needed at runtime. It's just some compile time artifact. There's not a good scope in Maven, so um, I could use provided, but um, yeah, that's the way I could do it. But the other more interesting thing is, is this processor jar here. And that's not a regular dependency, but instead it's uh, added to the annotation processor path. So the Maven compiler plugin in recent versions, it has this new option annotation processor path. And this is where I can put these compiler plugins, and then they will be invoked by the compiler <coughs> for me. 
All right, so I have those customer objects here. On the source side, I use properties and then getters and setters. And on, on the target side, on the DTO, I just use public fields. So it's just a DTO. I don't care about this, just some fields. So that's the stuff I'm going to use. So in the first thing I'm going to do is I create a new interface. I call it customer mapper. And I add the add mapper annotation to it, which makes it uh, a mapper in terms of map struct. And if I save it, automatically the code generation kicks in for me. And if I go here now to the folder with my generated sources, um, I see this customer mapper input, which is generated for me. So nothing is in there yet, but the code generation already is kicking in. So let me add a method to it. So I would like to map into a customer DTO. That's my output object called customer to DTO. And if I hit save again, this, oh, I should fix the import, of course. And if I hit save again, then the generated implementation will contain an implementation of this method. And now it al already maps all the properties which it can for me, so which have the same name. They will be mapped automatically for me. There are some conversions going on. So for instance, this credit score property, it has different types on source and target. So in the source, it's a big decimal. Uh, on the target side, it's a double here for just for the case of for the sake of the example. A mapstruct knows about many of those type conversions and can generate the code automatically for me to take care of such a conversion. And first name and last name, for instance, they are just propagated. So let me go to the contract again, and I hope you can see it. It's marked with a warning marker, so it's the yellow underline. And this is saying to me, there's an unmapped target property. And this is because the ID property, I chose a different name in this DTO than in the source object. And of course, this tool cannot know, okay, customer ID, it's the same as ID on the source side. So I need to help a bit with this, and I'm using this quick fix here. And by the way, so as I said, this pl compiler plugin is independent of the ID, but I'm still, there is an Eclipse plugin for MapStruct, which, for instance, provided me with this quick fix here, so that there's just some assistance for me when I'm authoring such a mapping contract. And now I just say, okay, this uh, should be mapped from ID. And by the way, I have, I should have auto completion here. Um, let me try it again. Oh, that's not working perfectly. Anyways, there should be auto-completion. I'm not sure why it's not working right now. But now this um, warning marker goes away. And if I go to the um, generated implementation again, now the ID property is mapped to customer ID. So that's pretty much what I wanted. The next thing to show is this date format. So this is a string in the uh, target object, but it's a local date on the source side. And I'm just using a default date format here. And I would like to customize this a bit. So I can, again, go there and adjust this format a bit, saying the target is um, date of birth. And now I can specify a date format, just choosing something simple, or something like that. And again, if I take a look at the generated code, now this date format will be used here. OK. Um, that's pretty good. So now I'm going to the DTO again, and let me add some more properties to it. So for instance, I have this title property here, and this is a string here, but I'm now getting an error. So I, I added a new property to this DTO, and I'm getting an error here, and this one is telling me, okay, there's this title property, and on the target side, it's a string, but on the source side, it's a title object, and now MathStruck doesn't know about this. It's something which I just have here in this project. So that's something I need to convert myself. So I'm doing this, and for it, I'm adding a new met method here, which I implement myself now, and I'm just using a Java 8 default method for that. And all I'm doing is I just return the title, the value in there. And now it, what's that? Oh, yes, yeah, thank you so much. Return type is missing, all right. And now for the title property, it calls this method for me. So based on the type of the property, source and target type, which is to be mapped, this other method is chosen for me. Um, so now each customer, let's say, also has an address object, an address which is referenced. So there's an address DTO on the target side and an address object on the source side. And if I add this, um, it automatically generates this address to address DTO method 
for me and makes use of this uh, in the customer mapping method. But it might be I would like to have some more control over this address mapping. So maybe again, some names are different and so on. And for that, I already have prepared another mapper, the address mapper, and I would like to plug this one in. So all I need to do for that is I just add it as a used mapper here. And now this one um, will be used automatically by this generated method. So it creates now an instance of this address mapper and makes use of this method. And again, the method is chosen by means of the uh, property types which are to be mapped here. And the last thing I wanted to show is um, this full name thing. So let's say we have this additional property on the target side which represents first name plus last name in one single string. Um, and if I don't have a full name property on the source side, and so I need to take care of that myself. And something which is quite useful for this is um, what we call expressions. So I can say the full name, it should be an expression. And this literally is just some Java snippet which I can use here. So obviously I would just make use of this for some short stuff, but it can be a useful thing to solve this kind of issue. So in th this one then, let me copy this one. <clears throat> is just literally copied into the uh, generated class. So it's some kind of extension me mechanism for me if I don't want to implement a, a separate proper method. Um, of course, I also need to get hold of such a mapper, and um, this is where component models uh, come in. So I'm, I could say this customer mapper, it should use the CDI component model. And this will cause then the generated implementation to have this application scoped annotation at the definition. And this allows me then to just inject this uh, class or this instance into a code which needs this kind of mapper. There also is support for Spring. Um, and as a fallback, there's some kind of factory which we provide if you don't happen to work with any sort of component model. Okay, that's pretty much what I wanted to show. So let me go back to the slides. Um, What's, what are the advantages, in my opinion, of this approach of generating code? For once, it's type safe. So you work with those typed interfaces. It cannot happen that you map a customer, let's say, into an order DTO because you work with these typed interfaces. You get very quick feedback, as you have seen. So if something in my mapping is wrong, as the title property, which couldn't be mapped, I learn about it right in my IDE or when I build the project. Or if my mappings are incomplete, I have uh, more properties on the target side which I don't map, and usually that's some sort of bad indication that the property isn't populated. I will also get a warning or even an error, depending on the configuration, and compile that as or compare that to a reflection-based approach, where you only would find out about this kind of stuff at runtime, and it would take you much longer to react to this. It's quite easy to debug, so you see the generated code, you can take it, um, you can take a look at it. In the worst case, let's say there would be a bug in map struct and the generated code would just be wrong for whatever reason. So you could even take the, copy, the code and copy it into your project and maintain it yourself from there on. Uh, of course, that's not what is intended, but you could do it so you're not, um, not tied into a corner here. And finally, it's, it's, it's fast, so there is just plain method calls or just plain field um, um, calls, so no reflection involved. And it works as we have seen in the IDE and on Maven and whatever, Cradle. <clears throat> There's much more which I couldn't show. There, there is support for collection methods, so I could have a method which takes a list of customers and maps it into a set of customer DTOs. There's update met methods, which is very useful if I need to map uh, back from a DTO into my entity, for instance, which then is attached. And much more, uh, go to the reference guide, which describes all the features in great length. And the biggest new thing I would like to mention is there's this IntelliJ plugin. So here I'm showing Eclipse, but one um, 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 person from the community was very active on contributing this IntelliJ plugin. So you just can go to the IntelliJ marketplace and get this plugin there. And then you also have auto-completion. You can even have refactoring support. So if a property changes in your model, the mapping annotations will be adapted accordingly. And with that, I'm done. There are some resources. Go to mapstruct.org if you would like to learn more. Follow us on Twitter. And with that, I think there's one minute left for questions. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, does it support immutable objects? Does it support immutable objects? Um, yes, by means of mapping into builders. That's the answer I can give right now. And one of the next steps for us will be to support proper parameterized constructors on the target side. So currently, it just calls the 
um, the parameterless default constructor, but it will be in the next release probably support for proper constructors, which then allow you to have an immutable object. Yeah. So it, it's still, uh, so right now this version I've shown here, 1.2, it works with um, Java 6, uh, 6, sorry, 6 and later. Um, but this repeatable annotation feature I've chosen here, the, just giving those mapping annotations multiple times, this would only work with Java 8, but otherwise you still can use it on 6, but we will move to Java 8 soon. Yeah? Right, does it support other annotation processes than Lombok? We have worked just recently very closely together with Lombok. This had been an issue for a long time, but now the two things work nicely together. Time's up. Um, if you've got other questions, just come to me, and thank you so much again. <laughs> <coughs>